Hello everyone, um, welcome to the first of two videos today about intra and intermolecular forces. So let's go ahead and get started. The name is bond, chemical bond. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a bond geek, so this is kind of a play on words, but <clears throat> you get the idea that we're here talking about chemical bonds and the forces that are affecting chemical bonds and how they interact with one another. So the forces that are affecting matter, there are basically two major categories. There's intramolecular forces, and they're intermolecular forces. So let's deal with the first one, intra. So what is the difference between these two things? We don't really have a clue. So like the little baby here in the picture, we're trying to think about it. And the more we think about it, the more confused we get. So let's see if we can make some differences or make some sense out of this. So intramolecular forces. Just like intramural sports uh, are sports within one school, so you would play an intramural sport if you were playing um, within your school when you are when I was in middle school I played in an intramural volleyball team and we played against classes that were part of our school and so we had all of the eighth grade homerooms that played sports against one another and that was intramural because we were within the school so intramolecular forces are attractive forces forces within a compound so we're talking about inside the compound so when we look at intramolecular forces we know that electronegativity determines what's happening in a covalent compound. Um, we also know that atoms with high electronegativity desire electrons greatly and will share with another nonmetal to get what they need. Both compounds, Cl2 and H2O, exhibit this, but each is slightly different. So you can see we have some electronegativity differences between these two, but since they're the same, we have no difference but they're still bonded and that electronegativity is what causes that to happen here. The same thing here, we have the bond between the two H's and the O. There's an electronegativity difference between those two, causing them to want to share electrons, but you can see something different. We have green on one end here and this kind of reddish purple on the other end, and that must mean something. And you can see it means that one side is more positive and one side is more negative according to the gradation here. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So another intramolecular force here is the electrostatic force between an ionic bond. So you can see Na, the positive charge, <coughs> excuse me, and Cl, the negative charge, and we can see that they have some sort of bond between each other because of that electrostatic force. We know that electrostatic force makes that bond really, really strong. So in an ionic compound, the attraction between the metal and the nonmetal um, gives this electrostatic force because they're actually losing and gaining electrons causing this to happen. In a covalent bond there's also an attraction but this attraction is different because it's more the electronegativity bringing them together, the desire for electrons causing them to want to share. Um, so it's a little different but very similar. We're all trying to get an octet and this is how they do them. So. Let's look at covalent more closely because ionic makes sense. We have an electrostatic force, that's all there is to it. But in covalent, we have something a little different. We can have some situations that are a little different. And so what you can see here is we have a nonpolar covalent bond here where we have an equal sharing of electrons. Over here we have a polar covalent bond where they're still sharing electrons, but it's unequal. So this guy is seeming slightly positive, this guy is seeming slightly negative, so we have an unequal. Or we have the most extreme ionic bond. So this is between these two factors. So if you want to do like a gradation, you would have the nonpolar guy, then here, then here. So all ionic compounds are absolutely 100% polar, and there's nothing that we can say about that. But covalent compounds can be either polar or nonpolar. Ionic is as polar as we can get. Having two opposite charges gives us definitely two poles. But in a covalent bond, it's not ionic. There are not charges, but we can get some behavior like that. So how is polar polarity determined? Some simple rules. First, check the electronegativity difference between the atoms. If there are more than two atoms, you have to go to step number two. But if not, we have two atoms. The molecule is nonpolar if the difference is 0.4 or less. The molecule is polar if the difference is 0.5 or greater. Some people vary on this, but we're just going to kind of stick to this kind of idea. 0.4 or less means nonpolar, 
0.5 or greater means polar. Now there are gradations of polar. There's slightly polar and there's very polar. So again, um, a lot of things going on here. So rule two applies to things with three or more atoms. Again, we're checking the electronegativity, but we have to look at the central atom first and then check the surrounding atoms. If all the differences are 0.4 or less, then the molecule is nonpolar. If any electronegativity difference is 0.5 or greater, then we go to the next step and we have to do a little bit of work. So step three, if there are any unshared pair of electrons on the central atom, then the molecule is polar. So if you look at water, water has unshared electrons. So there are the shared electrons in water, but there are the unshared electrons in water. So water has a polar nature. It also is polar because this is a more electronegative, but they're trying to tell you that if there's, there are unshared pairs of electrons that we're going to have a polarity going on there. So then if each of the surrounding atoms are pulling with equal and opposite force, then the molecule is nonpolar. So this goes into the geometry. So the geometry also determines if there's going to be polarity. So if we have oxygen here and we had hydrogen here and hydrogen here, now this does not happen, but if they were 180 degrees from each other, this guy would be pulling this way, this guy would be pulling this way, and so there would be no polarity if that were the geometric shape of water, but it is not. That is the, the geometric shape of water is actually like this. So we just have to remember that and have to remember that Water is shaped like this, meaning that it's polar, so there's always a dipole moment going up that direction. But if it were flat, we wouldn't have that difference. So geometry plays a pr pretty important role. So if you have atoms that are equally pulling in opposite directions, then it cancels out any polarity and it makes it nonpolar. So four pretty simple rules. First, look at the electronegativity, whether it's a two-atom situation or three-atom situation. Look at the central atom, it's three atoms, then after you've done that, then look and see if we have unshared pair of electrons. If we have unshared pair of electrons, we definitely have a polar situation. If we have a polar situation, but they're pulling in opposite directions of one another, then we produce nonpolar. So, nonpolar molecules, for example. Nonpolar molecules result in two nonmetals having an electronegativity difference below 0.5. So here's one example. First example, hydrogen and hydrogen they have the second same electronegativity. So 2.1 minus 2.1 gives you zero. Pretty simple, right? S example number two is HI. A little different here. We have 2.1 and 2.5, but the difference is still 0.4. So HI, hydroiodic acid, is actually not a very polar acid at all. So these molecules are considered to be nonpolar because we can see the electron pair um, do not have great distances. So we're all good there. Okay, great differences in electronegativity. Now, if we're polar, we see electronegativity differences of, of 5.5 or greater. So here's the first example that we see, and we see H and Cl 2.1 to 3.0 is a difference of 0.9. If we were to do something like H and O, we have 2.1 minus 3.5, and that difference is 4.1. If we go H and F, it gets even greater, 2.1 to 4.0, and that becomes 1.9. So while this one is slightly polar, this is more polar, and this is almost ionic. So after you get over 2.0, it's pretty much an ionic deal. So you can see HF is getting very close. So these molecules are considered to be polar because the electron pair is held closer to the nucleus, of one of the atoms more often. So they're sharing unequally, basically. So that is our end of our intramolecular forces discussion.